So I think before we kind of get, there's a lot to talk about. Um, and before we get uh, too deep into it, you, you have, for, a, for an old journalist hand like myself, a difficult set of businesses to understand. You have a lot of holdings, and you recently restructured some of them in order to let uh, mail.ru go public. Can you give us an overview of the businesses that you're involved in? Well, essentially, there are two businesses. One is the Russian business, which is an operational company. And this is the company that I started 10 years ago. Um, and it went through a lot of tra transitions and transformations. But really now uh, managed to consolidate a lot of traffic in Russia and really a social network of Russia. Uh, and the uh, separate company, which is now called BST, uh, is the investment fund that is making investments globally. So I'm actually running the second part of the business right now. I'm running the fund, and I'm the chairman of the Russian entity, which went public. Right. Um, and, and DST, the, the fund, has uh, some very, very high-profile investments. Can you tick off kind of the top four or five? Well, there are only three. So it's Facebook, uh, Zing, and Groupon. I was hoping to steal the next one out of <laughs> Uh, just three yeah. in the last uh, 18 months, I think. So Facebook, uh, Zynga, and, Zynga Groupon. and Groupon. So all three uh, pre-IPO. And you, you've gotten to be known as, as an investor who has disrupted traditional approaches to investing at the what's known as the mezzanine level. Um, what's your philosophy there? Well, um, I... Uh, I mean, that's not for me to say how disruptive it is, but uh, what we do is um, really come in and, uh, you know, align ourselves with founders and, you know, the guys who are running the business. And uh, then through a transaction or a series of transactions, kind of take the liquidity pressure off the table for many early investors and employees and, you know, some of the founders. What does that mean, take liquidity pressure off? Well, if, um, if the company is growing fast, sometimes exponentially, then, you know, some of the founders and managers, they are not really keen to go public when the company is really big and mature and would have gone public, you know, um, uh, you know some other time. But the, um, the uh, you know, our role is really to, and other late stage funds, is to come in and uh, uh, take the liquidity pressure off the table so that the companies can still grow and develop the product another year or two before they eventually go public. Right. Um, and the terms on which you, you provide this financing, how do they differ from other companies that or other investment firms that might have also, you know, written large checks and, and, and done the same? Well, what we do is we um, mostly do secondary transactions. Probably 80% of the volume is secondary versus 20% primary. And uh, we also, um, you know, in coordination with the, uh, you know, management and, and the companies are doing employee buyouts. That was not very, you know, common thing uh, um, a few years ago. And then uh, we also uh, don't join boards. So basically kind of stay really a little bit distance from the operational activity. Which is unusual to, to, to f accumulate large stakes. For example, your, the, the stake in Facebook in the combined companies, the one you're chairman of, as well as the, the DST, um, is... 10%? Well, we're not really commenting on the exact numbers, but it's below 10. It's so 9.8. <laughs> um, but uh, widely reported to be one of the largest, if not the largest stake that is under the control of one person. Um, but you don't exert any control? You never? No. You don't inhabit the dreams of Mark Zuckerberg at night? And uh, no, I mean, because our business model is based on really be being very focused and making investments in social internet globally. So we often run into the situation that if we would join uh, any of the boards, 
then uh, we would immediately be conflicted with, be conflicted. Uh, with the next yeah. investment or the previous investment. So I think it's a safe uh, model kind of not to join the boards as a matter of principle. Right. Um, to that end, the largest uh, social network in Russia is, is your company. Yes. Um, this is the only one exception. <laughs> You're the chairman of that company. Yes. You, you um, can only do it once. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that is a great competitor to Facebook in Russia. Um, has that ever been brought up to you by anybody at Facebook? Uh, no. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, situation that actually a part of the Russian company is sort of a small stake in Facebook, uh, which also creates some sort of an interesting Right, dynamics. so mail.ru owns 2.4% according to the filings of, of Facebook, right. even though, even as it, but then again, Google owned a big chunk of Baidu, and right. things get weird quickly when you make investments and then change strategies. Um, so, do you give any informal advice to Andrew at Groupon or Mark at, at, at um, Zynga or Mark at Facebook? I think it's actually the opposite. I sometimes get informal advice from them. Like, don't invest in Twitter? Um, sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, but, um, but actually, this advice, is, I think, is very, very valuable. Um, You've been widely quoted, and you were in Monaco last week um, interviewed, uh, as saying that you have a very sort of parameterized list of companies that you're interested in investing in. Can you give us those parameters? Well, uh, the, uh, usually this is a company which is kind of can be qualified as a late stage company, probably a billion dollar plus valuation. And uh, it is in the usually in the social internet space, uh, and it can be in you know anywhere in the world. Um, and my guess is there are probably 25 to 30 companies like that that are still not public. Right. Um, can you name three or four of them that you think fit that bill? Um, I mean, I have the full list. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it's a, <laughs> go as long as you'd like. It's a, um, I mean, it's really a, you know, anybody can, can, can make this list up. It's, uh, all these companies are pretty well known. Um, and, uh, but it, it really takes time to build these relationships. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I, I'm usually on the road, maybe, um, 500 hours, uh, a, a year uh, or more. Uh, on a plane and right. just moving around and um, just trying to... So uh, how are your relationships at Twitter right now? Um, what about them? <laughs> well, they seem to match your, your profile. Um, they should be in this list by definition, but yeah. we, uh, you know, we don't really comment on anything that right. has not happened. Well, I'm just trying to get something out of you here, Yuri. You're being pretty, pretty difficult to get. So let me pivot. Um, I want to bring up, as I had to with Robin, uh, uh, the, the question of Russia. Right. Um, you know, Russia has, has been through a very turbulent couple of decades. Um, uh, you've worked in, in Russia for a long time. Um, one of, you actually worked with the uh, chairman and CEO of, uh, of Yukos prior to um, uh, his, his founding of Yukos and, and running Yukos. Um, in the news very much and very much read in the Silicon Valley where his statements, his closing statements in the court case in which he basically called the Russian government uh, corrupt and unfair um, and said that it was impossible to be an entrepreneur and that an entire generation of Russian entrepreneurs were waiting to hear uh, whether or not true justice was going to be done. Now, I, I know I'm veering off into politics here, but when you've got world maps behind you that you made up, I guess you're allowed to. Um, what did you make of those statements? And do you find it to be difficult as a, as a Russian entrepreneur to, 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 to those statements resonate with you? 
Well, I've been in, in business basically for 10 years in Russia, but my area was really very narrow and focused around internet. Uh, if anything, the sector was completely unregulated, still is, and um, there was really no um, government involvement uh, in, in, in that sector. Um, this is, I mean, this is a very innovative sector and uh, a lot is going on there, but, you know, that's, that's basically what I've been doing for the last 10 years. But do you, I mean, you had a very successful IPO with mail.ru. Um, I can't imagine that that happened without the government blessing it, and, and they're, they're probably paying attention is my guess. Have you run into that, or is it that you're particularly good at diplomacy? Are there things, does it, is it difficult to start a company there, or, or is this? Well, you, you'll be surprised, but we did not ask the government when we went public, but if you read our prospectus, uh, there are a lot of pages, a lot, uh, titled, you know, risk factors. So, and was uh, the government in those risk factors? Uh, there was a lot about, you know, Russia and legal system and... Oh, because it was not a, it. it was not a, it, it, you went public out of the country. Right, yeah. so... Um, and why did you choose to do that? To go public? No, out, of, out the of the country? Well, because, you know, the financial sector in Russia is not yet developed and uh, it's kind of normal for a Russian business to go public in, in London. And that, that's what we've done. Right, right. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on this. I'll just ask, is, is, do you have sympathy with the statements made by the former CEO of Yukos? Or do you feel like he is poking the bear, so to speak? Well, I have not... I have not actually read his final comments. Really? Yeah. I find that hard to believe. Really? Yes, honestly. Well, then again, I haven't seen The Social Network. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose, have you seen that film? Yes. Did you like it? A lot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting to hear <laughs> from the guy who has control of 10% of Facebook. But then again, um, I hear it was a good film. I, uh, I think so. I yeah. think it's, uh, it's about, you know, the new trend of mathematicians kind of really yeah, being... Yeah, you, you, you speak about that quite a bit. And please, we're, we're, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions for Yuri. So come on up and, and, and as I see you all, weave you into the conversation. Talk to me a little bit about that. You've been quoted talking about the sort of trend of math uh, prevailing. Uh, can, you un can you unpack that for us? Well, I just think that when you have two billion uh, people connected and when you have pretty powerful machines to process information that's being accumulated, then by definition you would see a lot of mathematicians really having a chance to have a significant impact. And um, I think in the next 10 years you will probably see maybe four or five billion connected the creation of information is going to be unprecedented. And uh, that gives a chance to this unique combination of, you know, mathematical genius and computing power to really maybe uh, dominate even uh, global agenda in, in, uh, in 10, 20 years. What does that mean when the guys who are really good at math are in charge? Because I'm not good at math, so clearly I won't be one of them. Well, you should go see the movie. You will see what... <laughs> <laughs> I definitely should, um, and I will. Um, I thought maybe I should talk to Mark before I saw it. It just struck me as the right thing to do. Um, you were a very, very early uh, believer uh, in, in Facebook. Uh, yes. and, and probably, and when we spoke in my office some months ago, uh, you, you were almost sort of fervent in, in your belief in Facebook. What is it about the, the service that, that, you know, was there a moment where you just had an aha? Um, I think it's, it's sort of the company that can fundamentally change the way the information is being exchanged and processed to the extent that it can actually be the 
uh, the basis for artificial intelligence to develop over time. Uh, I think that when you have you know, billions of people connected and the unprecedented pace of creation and exchange of information, then you need filtering mechanisms. You, know, you need, you know, as, a, as an individual, you need somebody to filter this information for you. And I think now we're in the very early stages when your friends and your network is doing it for you, like on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, or we have the Google approach that, you know, there are a whole bunch of machines that are learning fast and trying to offer something to you. So I think there will be a convergence of those two models. Mm -hmm. And I think Facebook could be one of the platforms where the, you know, artificial intelligence will really emerge in, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. We have a question over here. Uh, Dean Takahashi from VentureBeat. Um, had a couple of questions. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of the your, uh, potential for disagreement or divergence of interests between Zynga and Facebook? And the second question is that you're an investor in both social and game companies. Uh, a lot of social uh, companies are moving into games and a lot of game companies are trying to move into social as well. What do you, what do you think of the whole collision that is, that is happening there? Well, I think uh, to answer the second question, uh, you know, the social gaming is really kind of becoming dominant uh, as far as gaming is concerned and uh, in terms of size and revenues and influence. And I think that over time, you know, all, all, all gaming will probably be social. Uh, but to answer the first question, I think it's uh, sort of a really classic uh, dynamic between the platform and the dominant player on the platform. So I think it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to observe how this dynamics is being played out. And uh, um, I mean, it's, it's always a you know, balanced act in a way, uh, which you know, is, is work in progress, essentially. Over here, Chris. Yeah, um, a question for you maybe picking up a little bit on John's thread. There's been a lot of information recently about journalists being attacked uh, brutally in Russia, sort of independent voices, and I'm just curious, you're acting almost on a global stage with b your investments and with Russia, what you're doing in uh, mail.ru. Do you think that there's an obligation that comes along with that to support independent voices or, or not, and just your thoughts on what's happening with journalism in Russia right now? Yes, well, this is basically a question about um, kind of really running the business or sort of focusing on politics. I mean, there are, um, there are certain situations where, you know, it's kind of really very hard to find the middle ground. And, you know, my, my choice and our company choice was really to focus on business and, uh, you know, do something well uh, over there. So that's, that's kind of the choice that we have made. Other people are making different choices. And um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really always an uh, individual decision. Is it impolitic to comment on, on these issues if you are a well-known leader of a Russian business? Um, again, it depends on definition. It's, it's where you draw this line. So as I understand it, you're drawing it. <laughs> I understand. Um, do we have other questions for Yuri? Um, I am curious. Uh, it strikes me that your fund is poised, even with just three, for an, a pretty good 18 months, <laughs> maybe two years. All three of the companies that you're involved with are, um, you know, set up, if not declaratively, at least expectantly, for public offerings. Um, and what you've done is given them some run room to, to get ready for that. But it's presumptive that that will happen. For, uh, certainly, I would hope, you would hope so, given that you're an investor and you want an exit. Um, the next crop, will they have exactly the same sort of look to them? Or you know, do you see a shift coming in, in, in 
as the earlier, I don't know if that was Ben, I couldn't see because of the lights, uh, questioner asked, you know, you've got Zynga differentiating itself from Facebook, right? And Mark was here yesterday. Um, do you see a, a new crop coming and a new kind of framework, or is the framework that, in, that informed the first set of companies the same framework that you're using for the next? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say what future holds. For example, the IPO of the Russian company, uh, which is the first IPO of a social company globally, I think, of, in a major way, um, might really change these dynamics a little bit because, you know, if that IPO is successful, then that might open up this market right. again, and some companies may just opt to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, so I think it's always kind of a moving target. Right. Uh, but I think our business model kind of makes sense because, again, in the, in the exponential growth phase, uh, there is always the tendency for the management of founders to focus on product and hiring people and that sort of stuff rather than uh, being diverted uh, to deal with you know, multiple investors and, right. and that sort of thing. Right. Um, you yeah, know, the founders that I've spoken to are very, very happy to be working with you. They seem to be, it's a perfect relationship from what they've said. Um, last question, uh, we've got a question from Corey. Oh, we have one over here too. Um, I'm going to hold my questions and give them to the audience because we don't have much time. Corey? Uh, question about the IPO. In the, in the prospectus, there's talk of giving some of the shares and some of the social media companies, Facebook, to some Series D holders. Or so. Why, why spin off some of the shares in those holdings, and who did those go to? Uh, say it again. Did you so in the, the in, in the IPO, but right before the IPO, it looks like uh, the mail RU, uh, dot RU took some of the shares in Facebook and others and gave them to some investors. Okay. For, who were those investors, and why did you do that right before the IPO? Well, basically, there was this consideration on the table. Uh, I think there was certain tax implications for some investors. And uh, the end kind of consideration was that probably we should just go public with these initial stakes in the business. Uh, but that was definitely a consideration at, at, at the time, and there was different pros and cons. So who were those U.S. investors in that didn't want to be part of the Russian IPO? or um, I think it was, in the end, kind of really a consensus position, including the U.S. investors. So you're not going to tell us who they are? Say it again? I'm just curious who they were, the people who ended up with the Facebook He wants to shares. know who you gave the shares to. Of what? Of Facebook, right? Ah, right. who were the investors who, yeah. were, uh, who bought the IPO? Right. No, who didn't want to be part of the IPO. It got spun out in the earlier offering. I'll, I'll go back and read the first Corey, who really reads these closely, will meet with you afterwards, and then he'll <laughs> probably publish his findings after he discusses it with you. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Uh, and last question over here. Yes, you mentioned that about 80% of your investments are later stage investments, and about 20% are early. Uh, you also discussed the parameters for the later stage. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, parameters for the 20% early stage investments that you make? So um, I was basically saying that 80% of what we do is secondary investments, and 20% is primary investments. That means that uh, it's just secondary versus primary. It's not early stage versus late stage. It's all late stage. So secondary is that he's buying the shares from employees who hold it. For example, in the private market and Facebook, you built up quite a position in the private market and Facebook buying from employees who want to who, who want to get liquidity before there's a liquidity event. So they sell their shares in a private secondary market. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're out of time, Yuri. Thank, thank you, you very much for sitting with us and having Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you.